thanks everyone for being here and uh, thanks to organizers for um, initiating this workshop. Uh, so I will talk about uh, the results from two papers on the supercurrent in the quantum call regime and the uh, Cairo Andreev edge states. Uh, the authors of the second paper, the first two authors, uh, Ring Fajal and Ethan Arno, are uh, present in the audience. We can uh, ask them questions. Uh, the first work was done by former student Andrew Seredinsky. I also acknowledge uh, other members of the group, uh, as well as uh, theory support from Harold Branger and his uh, student uh, Alex Bondarev and the uh, uh, samples uh, bore nitrate material from Watanabe and Taniguchi. So the outline for the talk is pretty straightforward. I will talk about the supercurrent and eventually quantum call based uh, squid. And then uh, the main part of the talk will be on Cairo and the FH states. Um, a few years ago, we have uh, published uh, the paper uh, where we have observed uh, a small but uh, noticeable supercurrent in a uh, quantum hole sample, um, uh, essentially two terminal uh, graphene based device uh, made of uh, encapsulated graphene with uh, uh, superconducting contacts made out of uh, molybdenum donor uranium. Um, the initial um, hypothesis for the origin of the supercurrent in this case involved uh, chiral and ray edge states. Uh, essentially, we have I've been discussing the possibility of Andreev edge states which enclose the perimeter of the sample, uh, having um, electrons and holes which have to propagate on the opposite like images of the samples, uh, complete the loop via uh, reflections via chiral Andreev edge states. Our current understanding is that, uh, at least in the samples where uh, we can control uh, the edges, the um, supercurrent is carried via non-chiral quantum hole states, as shown uh, in this cartoon, where electrons and holes are uh, counter-propagating, forming Andreev bound states on each edge of the sample. So let me show a few view graphs uh, uh, to, to prove that. So in order to control electrostatics uh, near the edges, we have made a sample uh, where uh, the graphene layer continued uh, past the uh, junction. Uh, so let me make one step back. Uh, basically, I'm saying that in this uh, typical samples, electrostatic dictates uh, density buildup because uh, the graphene is not forming a perfect parallel plate capacitor near the edges uh, where the um, uh, stray field from the back gate uh, creates extra density. Uh, the density profile is inhomogeneous, and we may have counter-propagating edge states. So in order to control this uh, density buildup, we have um, made the sample where uh, graphene is almost continuous, except for these uh, narrow trenches, which are smaller than uh, the depths of the back gate. And if you apply zero back gate, uh, sorry, zero side gates, uh, the uh, electrostatics is expected to be uh, uh, more or less that of a parallel plate capacitor. However, we can apply voltage to those remaining pieces of graphene and those will then serve as back gates, uh, sorry, as side gates, allowing us to uh, easily enhance or suppress the density uh, near the edge as uh, shown in this cartoon. And here's a view of the sample. Here are the trenches. They are separated from graphene junction by a small distance and they're about uh, 60 nanometers wide. Uh, if we, um, so here's a resistance map in the normal state as a function of the two gates. Uh, this uh, red square in the middle corresponds to uh, resistance uh, of uh, H over 2E squared, so mu equals 2 uh, in, the, in the, everywhere in the sample. Um, and uh, by applying is a gate, we can go from there to a uh, filling factor of mu equals 6. So that's uh, accumulation of the next Landau level near the left gate or near the right gate. And if you uh, measure the resistance as a function of this gate, as shown in this green curve, you see that uh, the filling factor essentially changes from mu to from uh, 
nu equals two uh, to nu equals six. Uh, if you applied one gate and then you added the second gate following this red line, you go from uh, six uh, to 10 because you have a total of 10 channels crossing uh, the device. There are two original uh, states of the nu equals uh, a uh, two lando uh, uh, new equals two lando level uh, plus there are additional four uh, states on each edge of the sample. Okay, we now focus on this region and we now uh, study the superconducting properties. So so far the voltage applied was fairly large and uh, the uh, any supercurrent was suppressed. Now we are dialing down the uh, applied bias and looking at a similar map in this magenta square at low bias. So we immediately uh, see uh, many features appearing here. And uh, one noticeable thing is that within this red square, uh, we still see a quantized conductor, quantized resistance. So we see no supercurrent as long as uh, the uh, density near the edges is monotonically decreasing and we have only edge states propagating uh, in one direction. If we now uh, move to uh, this point on the map by applying one of the side gates, uh, we find that at small bias, uh, there is a suppression of resistance and that corresponds to creation of the counter-propagating uh, edge state here on this uh, picture density uh, profile on the uh, decreasing density side of the, uh, I cannot put my pointer there, but um, it's a, a decreasing uh, density profile. Um, there is pretty much no dependence on magnetic field because the area enclosed inside this entry of edge state is extremely small. Uh, we can uh, uh, estimate that the distance between the states based on the lack of magnetic field dependence should be uh, less than 100 nanometers. If we now apply the second side gate, we will have uh, the similar density bump uh, formed near the other edge of the sample. And uh, in this case, our profile of the resistance versus magnetic field and bias uh, immediately changes. We have this periodic dependence of the critical current on magnetic field. And uh, that uh, could be interpreted as forming a squid where uh, the supercurrent is carried separately on each edge of the sample. By applying these gates, we can uh, go back and forth between the periodic and non-periodic behavior. And um, uh, uh, that uh, pretty much uh, uh, answers uh, the puzzle that uh, Carlo has mentioned, unfortunately, in a fairly trivial way. I uh, know now that uh, the uh, Andreev H states are not involved in the supercurrent and uh, um, at least Andreev H states running along the length of the contact. We still don't know uh, how the Andreev H states near each edge of the sample are completed, whether we have a little bit of the chiral Andreev H states coupling uh, between these two counter-propagating states. Uh, I have mentioned that uh, by the lack of magnetic field dependence here over something like 40, 50 millitesla, we can estimate the area of uh, the state. The height here is half a micron. We estimate that the width distance between the two counter-propagating states should be less uh, than 100 nanometers, but we can tell if it is larger than coherence length of the metal, which is below 10 nanometers, or is it uh, small. So we don't know if you need any other agent to connect these two propagating states. Okay, um, we uh, have uh, then moved to the uh, direct, uh, more direct measurements of the chiral drive edge states. Uh, so here is a sample we studied quite a lot. Uh, it has uh, one uh, superconducting contact, which is uh, relevant for this measurement right here, and the number of normal contacts. Uh, we are biasing the normal contact uh, here, and we are grounding the superconductor. And then we are measuring uh, the voltage 
downstream from the superconductor. Uh, this voltage could have been expected to be zero, it's not zero, and we can uh, divide the voltage by the applied current uh, and label that as a downstream uh, longitudinal resistance, so downstream RxX. We also measure the conventional quantum hole resistance uh, between these two contacts. So what we find then uh, that when the longitude, sorry, transversal uh, conductance of the sample is quantized, the downstream resistance is uh, uh, not equal to zero. There are these fluctuations uh, which are very reproducible upon multiple uh, gate sweeps. Uh, they um, die as we increase temperature above um, you know, scale of a couple of Kelvin, so probably comparable to the critical uh, temperature of the uh, superconductor of this field. And uh, at that point, uh, the longitudinal resistance uh, becomes um, more or less equal to zero, while the uh, transversal resistance still stays quantized. So we know that the quantum hole is still uh, working, and effectively we made our contacts normal for the purpose of the uh, chiral uh, Andreev uh, edge states. And uh, probably we are uh, essentially absorbing any incoming electrons without having any downstream uh, flow. Uh, next, we, uh, in the same sample, can measure other filling factors. We are uh, ignoring the uh, uh, broken symmetry states, which are not as robust. We are focusing at nu equals two and nu equals six. We see that we can have this uh, downstream signal being negative uh, in both cases. Uh, we have uh, made, uh, well, uh, many uh, checks, but one of uh, simple ones is to move the ground uh, from the superconducting contact, uh, one contact upstream to here, and to uh, measure uh, the voltage in the same configuration, so only the ground contact is moved, in which case uh, we obtain this blue curve where longitudinal resistance becomes zero, here it's n equals two, n equals six, while the um, resistance in the case when the superconductor is grounded is showing this noticeable uh, resistance uh, fluctuations, which can be both positive and negative. Okay, so here's the interpretation. An incoming electron is uh, turning into a linear combination of the eigenstates along the interface, which are uh, very, very uh, poorly schematically written as E plus H and E minus H. So it's a, uh, of course, some uh, linear combinations of um, electrons and holes as dictated by the superconductor. These states propagate accumulating a uh, different phase. Uh, until at the end of the interface, we have some probability of getting an electron or a hole. Uh, an alternative uh, uh, language which I like to use to think about it is to say that we start with an electron and the superconducting coupling serves as um, an axis of rotation in the space, uh, in this block sphere where electron is represented by the uh, North Pole and the hole is represented by the South Pole. And as you are processing around Delta, you may find yourself on the South Pole or North Pole, in which case you stay an electron, you end up at the South Pole, you will have a hole, or you can have some intermediate probabilities. Uh, but if you uh, end at the South Pole with a hole, uh, the process can be viewed uh, uh, looking at this cartoon. Uh, here I'm plotting the energy. Uh, of the uh, incoming electron, which is positive with respect to the chemical potential of the superconductor. As it forms a Cooper pair in the superconductor, the hole is released below the Fermi energy. That hole floats to the downstream contact uh, and lowers its uh, chemical potential, resulting in the observed uh, negative uh, resistance. Um, so Harold uh, and uh, Alexei have uh, made uh, numerical simulations uh, using uh, uh, quant. Uh, they have simulated graphene superconductor interfaces shown here, uh, calculated the dispersion of the two chiral states. 
And uh, here, uh, this uh, image is in fact from uh, combined electron hole density. You can see the uh, lattice uh, uh, here of the uh, underlying uh, superconductor uh, and, uh, and, and the graphene. And uh, electron density is shown in red, hole density is shown in blue. Uh, of course, the result, whether you have a hole or electron uh, emitted downstream depends on the length of the interface and the chemical potential. Here it's chosen to be such that uh, electrons are, sorry, holes are emitted. Uh, there are also uh, 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 simulations of uh, this uh, process and uh, the role of disorder in the system in the uh, work of uh, Antonio Manesca and uh, Anton Akmerov. Um, next, we study the energy dependence of uh, the uh, downstream resistance. So we measure differential downstream resistance as a function of applied uh, DC current. Uh, we are obtaining maps like that. This is across uh, one of the plateaus. The edges of the plateau are on, uh, shown here on each side uh, as a function of uh, gate voltage. And in the bias direction, we see that uh, we have the spots of uh, positive and uh, negative differential resistance, which eventually gets washed away by around uh, 100 uh, uh, nanoamps, which is about um, uh, one milliliter volt. Well, actually, they are washed away earlier, so more like a few hundred uh, microelectron volt, which is comparable to the gap of the superconductor. Uh, looking at uh, the schematics, well, at the simulation of the excitation uh, spectrum, we see that uh, the momentum difference between the two will depend on energy. So as we change the energy, the delta K changes and we can expect uh, uh, changes of the signal. And in fact, we see that starting with a negative signal, we can get uh, to zero or starting with a positive uh, resistance, which is the case where electron is emitted, uh, we get uh, back to zero eventually at a large enough current. And for some values of the gate voltage, we may also start at negative signal and have a few oscillations uh, as may be expected from this picture as delta k is changing. Uh, importantly, this uh, picture doesn't look like uh, any, uh, well, some of the spurious effect might, may have expected, uh, uh, which would result in more of inclined uh, diagonal lines. And next, we could have expected uh, the similar behavior as a function of magnetic field because this delta K uh, is expected to change uh, when we apply magnetic field. But instead, we are observing this picture with lots of uh, switching, which um, uh, we attribute uh, to vortices. We see a zoom in into the uh, bigger lambda level fan, uh, focusing on uh, new equals uh, two plateau. We see that the signal can be continuous for a while, but then there will be jumps and the picture look very different. Uh, in terms of the block sphere, we can think of our electron slash hole uh, changing the rotation uh, axis around which it precesses. Uh, and as, uh, as it moves past the vortex where the uh, phase of the superconductor changes. And uh, in simulation, indeed, you uh, get the original perfect Sinusoidal oscillations getting scrambled. It's again from Harold's uh, in group uh, simulation, but uh, we can also see uh, the associated talk by uh, Vlad and uh, Leonid uh, in this conference. Uh, we can, uh, in fact, uh, sometimes catch uh, the system uh, near uh, entry point of a uh, uh, vortex or a few vortices and drive it back and forth by sweeping the field up and down by uh, just uh, 20 millitesla in this case, resulting in repeated uh, occurrence of the same type of pattern. So you can see that the pattern here after two cycles returns to more or less itself, while the switch occurs at slightly different uh, fields. So we believe those vortices are not yet uh, stable inside the contact, not yet pinned and can be moved out by changing the field. 
So the occurrence of those vortices allows us um, to collect statistics on the outcome of a typical uh, downstream signal process, a uh, down, downstream um, uh, 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 electron hole emission by looking at the maximum and uh, minimum of the longitudinal downstream signal uh, as a function of gate voltage and then plot each uh, value for uh, uh, maximized or minimized along the gate voltage as a function of magnetic field. And we find that uh, the positive and negative signals have a comparable amplitude, which means that uh, on average, we are uh, dealing with uh, neutral, uh, neutral uh, situations. There is no preference for electrons or holes, or in the block sphere picture, you can end up at any point on the block sphere uh, at the end of the contact. Uh, one note is, um, yeah. Glev, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're, we're around 20 minutes, um, just okay. as an alert. So, yeah, um, let, let me just uh, show uh, one last, uh, sure. last slide. So, uh, one of the uh, uh, things to notice here is a small scale of the observed signal. So, if you have, uh, say, in this case, a signal of a few hundred ohms, which should be compared to the uh, quantum of resistance. And uh, you could have expected uh, for, uh, say, from this formula for, uh, say, perfect uh, probability of emitting a whole uh, signal comparable to the longitudinal, uh, sorry, to the transversal resistance. So we believe that most of those um, electrons or holes don't make it to the other end of the contact. And this probability uh, of getting an electron or hole is multiplied by a fairly small survival probability of uh, at most a few tens of uh, percent, uh, most likely because uh, the superconductor has vortices and uh, uh, electrons or holes can tunnel into the normal uh, cores of the vortices. Uh, as you increase the length of the interface, the probability drops, as you may expect uh, here com comparing few uh, contacts with different uh, interface lengths from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, uh, clearly the uh, signal becomes much smaller. Okay, uh, let me uh, just uh, thank the group. These two guys are present in the audience and ask questions. Uh, and here are the two publications. Uh, thank you.